Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Checkpoint's Head of Incident Response, Dan Wiley. Isn't the cloud an amazing thing? Beautiful, scalable, ultimately flexible, and so peaceful and, and, and refreshing. You can almost do anything with it. It's a, it's a boundless opportunity. So we're not going to talk about clouds, because we could talk about clouds all day, cumulonimbus and all Cirrus, but we're not going to talk about those kind of clouds. We're going to talk about these kind of clouds, the clouds that are actually composed of billions of computers. And these billions of computers give you the ability to scale horizontally, do almost the most amazing things almost instantaneously, giving you the power that you never could imagine in your own data centers. Now, what we're going to do today is have a conversation about Martin. Martin is a CEO of a corporation that one day when he was on his vacation taking a walk in a suit, which I always do when I go on vacation, decided that he needed to consider a new architecture for his environment. He said, I'm going to the cloud. Now, I'm sure every last one of you had an executive that comes back from some epiphany on some great trip or some great conference talking to some great analyst that says, the cloud will transform your entire existence, so you must go there. And Martin has this thought, and he goes for moving to the cloud. Now, Martin doesn't know all the nuances, so he goes to Greg. Greg is his trusty IT guy. He is so jazzed about learning that he's going to the cloud. He gets ready. He's starting to look into everything. And Greg is really excited for this new opportunity to learn all the new cool, nifty stuff that the cloud has to offer. So Greg and Martin start having this great conversation about how to move into the cloud. So they wake up one morning and they say, what are we going to do? How are we going to get in the cloud? And they decide they're going to start simply with a really simple application. Martin comes to Greg one day and says, hey, we have a new advertisement campaign. We need to try out this cloud stuff because cloud first. And Greg goes, absolutely. Let's go create a web infrastructure to host advertisements. So they open a web browser, and they find out that AWS has a wonderful architecture to host web content. So they decide they're going to build a very simple infrastructure with a web tier, with a global load balancers, with an application tier, and a database tier. And, and why don't we stick some static content inside of S3 buckets so we can uh, get the scalability of uh, the S3 environment. So they do this. So they deploy a very simple application that basically serves advertisements. Now what they did, though, was they took their corporate infrastructure that had hosted those advertisements previously, and they said, copy and paste. Let's just put it in the cloud. That makes sense. We've got it working. Let's put it there. So they do that. Now, Greg is a smart IT guy. And he says, well, you know, we should worry a little bit about security. Let me do some reading. So one of the first things he does is goes to the AWS website, and he reads the manual. Have any of you read the manual for AWS? Yeah, it's not short reading. It's a couple 10,000, 20,000 pages. And in there, there's a great section around security, and they highlight what your responsibilities are for security. Well, I don't know about you, but if I look at this really carefully, it's the same shit that you had to do in the first place. It's the same security controls. It's exactly the same stuff. But Greg thinks, well, maybe we should try out these new security controls in these environments instead of using what we know works. So he decides he's going to use load balancers with access control lists. He decides that we're going to have simple controls with a WAF, and they deploy. Now, what's interesting here is the moment Greg for, uh, turned up an S3 bucket, he gets an email from Amazon saying, hey, guys, you might want to change your default configuration on the ACLs for your S3 bucket because we noticed that maybe an any, any allow might not be a good idea. Now, Greg says, oh, wonderful. Well, I'll, I'll put some you know, controls around it. Everything's hunky-dory. So, he then looks and says, well, what would happen if I did this inside of Microsoft's environment? And he gets exactly the same graph, which says, you're still responsible for some stuff. Make sure that you do some security. 
Well, Greg and Martin go ahead and deploy, and, and uh, everything's up and running, and, and their advertisement is a great campaign, a great success, and they, it works. And the first day, uh, the system was designed to auto scale, and it auto scaled automatically to a handful of machines, and their advertisement is a great success. Now, the second day, Greg logs in, and he looks and he sees that it is doubled in size. And Greg says, hmm, that's pretty cool. Maybe, maybe that's just great advertisement and, and everything's coming together. And, and this AWS infrastructure is also great. Well, the next day he logs back in and it's scaled to four times its original size. And the next day, 16 times. And the next time, 32 times. It has grown so large that Greg goes, there is no way in hell some stupid little GIF is getting me that much hits. So he came and he looks at the system and he looks at the environment and he finds a process he does not recognize. He doesn't understand what this one process is doing. At that point, Greg calls the trusty checkpoint incident response team. And that's what we do. We come help customers deal with these types of events. And we take a look at the infrastructure and we find that HomeScale made a big boo-boo. He decided that uh, it would be smart to let the admin interface for the Java management console be exposed to the internet. Now all of you techie guys are going, oh no. Well, what had happened was an attacker had identified that infrastructure as scanning the internet, found a buffer overflow in one of the management consoles, was able to plant a Bitcoin miner into the system, and once you turn on a Bitcoin miner, it starts using CPU. Auto scales turned on, and now it's exponentially scaling outward. So the system basically did what you told it to do, which was scale large. Now, what ended up happening was that little binary did a little more than just Bitcoining, because you know those, no, those uh, resourceful attackers will utilize that infrastructure to their best advantage. It was also designed to be able to do DDoS attacks. It also was designed to be able to do data theft and also do some account takeover and other really nefarious stuff just by one binary and one tiny little mistake that Greg had made when moving his legacy infrastructure into AWS because he forgot that he didn't have his trusty corporate perimeter to actually protect the infrastructure back in AWS. Now, this is a great lesson learned, right? So, what Martin says is, great success. Let's move more into the cloud. We've learned our lesson. Everything's great. Let's keep going. We want to go cloud like crazy. I want to be able to check my email in, uh, in the water, anywhere in the world. Let's start moving our email into the cloud. Now, I'm sure all of you know Office 365. If you don't, you will. Because over the next few years, legacy exchange environments are going bye-bye. So you're going to have to go into 365 or not do email with Exchange. So Greg and Martin's like, well, let's move Exchange. Let's get it over there. Let's get it into 365 as quickly as possible. Now, the beautiful thing about 365 is that you get to use your AD infrastructure to actually use the authentication mechanisms, mechanisms within AD to utilize uh, Office 365. So Martin and Greg move both Active Directory uh, and move into ADFS and also into Office 365. Now, everything goes great. They move 10,000 email boxes. Everyone's happy. They're, they're, everything's working perfectly. Uh, they turned on some very basic security controls from Microsoft, and they think everything's great. But one day, something happens. So Greg gets a phone call from the head, uh, the CFO, and the CFO basically said, hey, uh, hey, Greg, uh, I got this email from Accounts Payable, but I uh, called Account Payable, and uh, that's not a real request. And, and Greg starts looking into the email, and, and he calls the Checkpoint Incident Response Team again to look at what's going on with this email. And we were able to determine that was actually a real email from the email box of accounts payable to the CFO. Someone had broken into one of the accounts payable uh, personnel's email box. And we started digging a little deeper and it gets much, much worse. 
we were able to determine that six months prior, a phishing campaign had been targeting this corporation. And in that phishing lure uh, was the ability to uh, uh, lure people to reset their credentials. And that's exactly what happened. But Greg had no clue on earth that 25 accounts had actually been compromised. And it wasn't just accounts payable. It was HR. It was the IT staff. It was many different accounts around the environment. Now, we started looking at this a little more deeply, and we found a very disturbing story. We found that every one of these accounts was used at different levels to get economies of scale out of that actual mailbox and those credentials. The first thing we found was that these uh, hackers had been using those uh, email accounts for phishing lures, internal to the organization, but then also external. We also found that if the user was a low-level uh, admin or, or just a worker within the environment, that they would use those accounts to send 9,500 spam messages a day out to the internet. And you go, no, guy, do you guys know why 9,500 is a magic number? Because Microsoft limits the number of emails any individual account can send to 10,000 per day. So the attacker knew that if he kept it just low enough under the radar, the account wouldn't get blocked. He would be able to send spam without any protections whatsoever to stop any of those outside spam. So once they have these accounts, they are truly monetizing the crap out of them. They really are studying them. One of the biggest things we find is that they whale, and what whaling is, is targeting the executive specifically to be able to steal large sums of money, intellectual property, and to extort them. This happens every single day of the week. Over the last two quarters, we have seen over a 300% increase in the number of incidents that we handle around Office 365 attacks today. I cannot stress enough that you need to take security controls around 365 exceedingly seriously because the attackers are targeting it directly. Now with this, Martin is still enjoyed. I mean, everything's great. We're going to now move absolutely everything into the cloud. Now Greg is a little bit tired because he's handled at least two major incidents in over the last few months while we're doing this whole cloud thing. And Greg is, is a, a, a willing participant and he's going to keep going into the cloud over and over and over again. And one day he wakes up and he goes into the data center and it's empty. Now Martin couldn't be happier because his capital expenditure is down to zero, but Mar uh, Greg has no more IT infrastructure. Now, I don't know if you guys are, are thinking about this, but you should think about this. One day you will wake up and you will find your data center just like this. But it changes the dynamic because now things that you have assumed are available to you are not. Greg calls me one day and says, hey, Dan, uh, we have a serious problem. Nobody can log in to any accounts in our entire corporation. I can't log into domain admin. I can't log into any of our user accounts. And I'm serious, every single account we try, we can't get access to any of our systems. So we start digging into what's going on. And we find that Greg had deployed an intranet site inside of AWS which was tied back to ADFS to do authentication. What we found was the attackers had identified that intranet site, and they profiled it, and they were able to see that there was a logo of Greg's company on the intranet site. They then went into LinkedIn, and they downloaded every single contact inside of LinkedIn that was associated with that corporation. And once they did that, they were able to identify all of the corporate email accounts for all of those users. All they had to do was take those, those email addresses and poke around a little bit to see if it's the actual credentials that are being used to log into the intranet site. So they took the credentials, found a botnet for $20 a day that would do a brute force login attack utilizing those credentials towards that intranet site. Now, Greg was a smart IT infrastructure guy. He knew 
that we needed controls inside of AD. And one of the controls was, after five repeated login attempts, lock out the account. And by the way, if you read uh, any of your security manuals, it says to do that. You need to lock out your accounts after X number of times. Well, in the cloud, that might not be such a good idea. Because now, once you lock out that account, how do you unlock it when every single solitary user is locked out of AD? This happened to a customer of ours. They were completely locked out of all infrastructure. That is a very bad day. What do you do? Now, if you get your trusty manual out and you read how uh, Windows domain uh, architectures work, your last resort is the keyboard and mouse. Uh, folks, they don't have a keyboard and mouse because it's in the cloud. So who are you going to call? A Ghostbusters. Very good. Thank you very much, Moti. No, you have to call Microsoft. Now, I love Microsoft. They really are pushing the edge on all of these technologies. But I got to tell you, about six months ago, it wasn't a pleasant conversation to say, I'm locked out. Can you go find server 75328713 in data center 7 rack? Oh, I don't know the rack. I don't know anything. <clears throat> Can you help us try to lock out, uh, unlock all of our accounts? Microsoft was able to do it. But it took about seven to eight hours to unlock an admin account to be able to get access. But here's the thing. You have to take this into consideration. You've got to get ready for the storm. The storm is already here, guys. It's happening. You have to prepare for these natural disasters that are going to occur inside of the cloud. Now, just a couple of really quick points on how to deal with all of these events. Number one, and I, get, I hope I see like a sea of, of, of cameras here to take pictures. Uh, first of all, you need visibility and control. This is simple stuff. This is the same stuff you did in your data center, but you've got to do it now in the cloud. So you've got to make sure you have a real gateway, not just access lists. If you think access lists and WAF are going to cut it, you are wrong. I can tell you every single day you're wrong. You need much more granular security controls, specifically around IPS protections, SSL inspection, host inspections, all of that put together. You need to be able to log all of this infrastructure, including new logs that you don't even know exist. Like, for example, all the VPC logs within AWS, or all of the management logs that you have never really looked at before. Take all of that into consideration and bring it all together. Recommendations around this are really simple. You need to have cloud-based protections. We've been talking about all this cloud guard stuff. You need to consider deploying that in these environments. Multi-factor authentication, every chance you get, turn it on. Central management. Ensure that you have protections around ADFS and AD if you deploy into the cloud. And the list goes on and on and on. Do not expect the cloud providers to give a shit. You need to take a proactive approach to the security of this environment. Inside of Office 365, you need to take phishing controls into consideration, spam protections, uh, account takeover protections. You've got to get all of the logs and review them. Review them understand them. And even within all of these architectures, the logs change. If you look at example from an exchange log to an O365 log, they're different. You're going to have to learn a new language on how to read these events and how to deal with them. Again, consider uh, multi-factor and cloud guard and other protections around email. Email today is the number one targeted application that I am seeing today. Number two, is Salesforce. Number three is Dropbox. So, and we've handled all of these cases multiple times over the last few years. It's just getting worse because the attackers know that this is the weak link in your armor. Now, attackers are adapting the cloud. You need to. You need to have visibility control, and you need to make sure that you continually test your incident response program to include cloud, and you need to work with your cloud vendors. They are more than happy to work with you. They really do want to participate in this dialogue. And you really need to sc in include security into your infrastructure. And when you do have a cloud that turns into a tornado, please feel free to call the Checkpoint Incident Response hotline 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And we will be here to assist with your tornado. Thank you very much.